Chapter 13 By noon of the following day, everyone in Arbilon knew of Ellen Roy Lesserdale's decision to invoke the power of the Loden and return the elves in their home city to the Westland. The Queen had sent word at first light, dispatching select messengers to every quarter of her besieged kingdom. Barsimon or radio to the officers and soldiers of the army, Triss to the elven hunters of the home guard, Eaton Shard to the remainder of the high council, and from there to the officials who served in the administrative bureaus of the government, and Gavilan to the market district to gather together the leaders in the business and farming community. By the time Wren had awakened, dressed, eaten breakfast, and gone out into the city, the talk was of nothing else. She found the elves' response remarkable. There was no panic, no sense of despair, no threats or accusations against the Queen for making her decision. There was uncertainty, of course, and a healthy measure of doubt. None among the elves had been alive when Arbalon had been carried out of the Westland, and while all had heard the story of the migration to Morrowind, few had given much thought to migrating out again. Even with the city ringed by the demons and life drastically altered from what it was in the time of Ellen Rowe's father, concern for the future had not embraced the possibility of employing the Loden's magic. As a result, the people talked of leaving as if the idea was an entirely new one, a prospect freshly conceived, and for the most part of the conversation that Wren listened in on, suggested that if Ellen Ray Lesserdale believed it best, then certainly it must be so. It was a tribute to the confidence that the elves placed in their queen that they would accept her proposal so readily, especially when it was as drastic as this one. It will be nice to go out of the city again, more than one said. We've lived behind walls for too long. Travel the roads and see the world, others agreed. I love my home, but I miss what lies beyond. There was more than one mention of life without the constant threat of demons, of a world where the dark things were just a memory and the young could grow without having to accept that the kill was all that allowed them to survive, and there could never be any kind of existence beyond. Some expressed concern about how the magic worked, or if it even would. But most seemed satisfied with the Queen's assurance that life within the city would go on as always during the journey, that the magic would protect and insulate against whatever happened without, and that it would be as before, except that in the place of the kill there would be a darkness that none could pass through until the magic of the Loden was recalled. She ran across Oren Street in the ma- market centre. The owl had been up since dawn gathering together the supplies the company of nine would require to make the journey down Kilishan slopes to the beaches. His task was made difficult mostly by the Queen's determination that they would take only what they could carry on their back and the stealth and quickness would serve them best in their efforts to elude the demons. The magic, I understand it, works like this, he explained as they walked back toward the palace. There's both a wrapping about and a carrying away when it is invoked. Once in place, It protects against intrusion from without, like a shell. At the same time, it removes you to another place, city and all, and keeps you there until the spell is released. There's a kind of suspension in time, the way you don't feel anything of what's happening during the journey. You don't have any sense of movement. So everything just goes on as before? Wren queried, 
trying to envision how that could happen. Pretty much. There isn't a day or night. Just the greyness, as if the skies were cloudy, the Queen tells me. There's air and water and all the things you need to survive, all wrapped carefully away in this sort of cocoon. And what happens once you get to where you are going? The Queen removed the load and spell, and the city is restored. Ren's eyes shifted to the owl, assuming, of course, that what Alan Rowe has been told about the magic is the truth. The owl sighed. So young to be so sceptical. He shook his head. If it isn't the truth, Ren, what does any of this matter? Ma? We are trapped on Morrowind without hope, aren't we? If you might save themselves by slipping past the dark thing, the most would perish. We have to believe in the magic. And the magic will save us, girl, because the magic is all we have. She left him as they neared the palace gates, letting him go on ahead, tired and stoop-shouldered, his thin, rumpled shadow cast against the earth, a mirror of himself. She liked Orin Street. He was comfortable and easy in the manner of old clothes. She trusted him. If anyone could see through them, through, see them through the journey that lay ahead, it was the owl. She turned away from the palace and wandered absently toward the gardens of life. She had not looked for Garth when she had risen, slipping from her room instead to search out the Queen. But Alan Rowe was nowhere to be found once again, and so she decided to walk out into the city by herself. Now her walk completed, she found that she still preferred to be alone. She let her thoughts stray as she entered the deserted gardens, making her way up the gentle incline toward the Elkrise and her thoughts as they had from the moment she had come awake, graviated stubbornly toward Gavilan and Lesserdale. She stopped momentarily, picturing him. When she closed her eyes, she could feel him kissing her. She took a deep breath and let it out slowly. She had only been kissed once or twice in her life, always too busy with her training, aloof and unapproachable, caught up in other things, to be bothered with boys, there was no time for relationships. She had no interest in them. Why was that? She wondered suddenly. But she knew that she might as well inquire as to why the sky was blue, as to questions who she he had become. She opened her eyes again and walked on. When she reached the outcries, she studied it for a time before seating herself within its shade. Gavilan Alessadel. She liked him, maybe too much. It seemed instinctual, and she distrusted the unexpected intensity of her feelings. She barely knew him, and already she was thinking of him more than she should. He had kissed her, and she had welcomed it. Yet it angered her that he was hiding what he knew about the magic and the demon. A truth he refused to share with her. A secret so many of the elves harboured. Alan Rowe, Eowyn, and the owl among them. But she was bothered more by Gavilan's reticence because he had come to her to proclaim himself a friend. He had promised to answer her questions when she asked them. He had kissed her. And she let him, and she had let him, and despite everything, he had gone back on his word. She smouldered inwardly at the betrayal, and yet she found herself anxious to forgive him, to make excuses for him, and to give him a chance to tell her in his own time. But was it any different with Gavilan 
than it had been with her grandmother? She asked herself suddenly, hadn't she used the same reasoning with both? Perhaps her feelings for each other were not so very different. The thought troubled her more than she cared to admit, and she shoved it hastily away. It was still calm within the garden, secluded amid the trees and flower beds, cool and removed beneath the silken covering of the old Christ. She let her eyes wander across the blanket of colours that formed the gardens, studying the way they swept the earth like brush strokes, some short and broad, some thin and curving, borders of brightness that shimmered in the light. Overhead the sun shone down out of the cloudless blue sky, and the air was warm and sweet-smelling. She drank it in slowly, carefully, savouring it, aware as she did so that it would all be gone after tonight, that when the magic of the lodum was invoked, she would be cast adrift once more in the wilderness dark of Morrowind. She had been able to forget for a time the horror that lay beyond the keel, to block away her memories of the stench of sulphur, the steaming fish shoes and the crust of lava rock, the swelter of Kilishan's high heat rising off the earth, the darkness in the vault, and the wraths and growls of the demons at hunt. She shivered and hugged herself. She did not want to go back out into it. She felt it waiting like a living thing, crouched down patiently, determined it would have her. Sit, she must come. She closed her eyes again and waited for the bad feelings to subside, gathering her determination a little at a time, calming herself, reasoning that she would not be alone, that there would be others with her, that they would all protect one another, and that the journey down out of the mountains would pass quickly, and then they would be safe. She had climbed aboard unharmed to Arbalon, hadn't she? Surely she could go back down again. And yet her doubts persisted, nagging whispers of warning that echoed in the Adishag's warning at Grimpen Ward. Beware, elf girl. I see a danger ahead of you. Hard times and treachery and evil beyond imagining. Trust no one. But if she did as the Adishag had advised, if she kept her own counsel and gave heed to no one else, she would be paralysed. She would be cut off from everyone. And she did not think she could survive that. How much had the Adishag seen of her future, she wondered grimly. How much has she failed to reveal? She pushed herself to her feet, took a final look at the outcries and turned away. Slowly she descended the gardens of life, stealing as she went faint memories of their comfort and reassurance, brightness and warmth, tucking them away for the time when she would need them, or when the darkness was all about and she was all alone. She wanted to believe it would not happen that way. She hoped the Adishag was wrong. But she knew she could not be certain. Garth caught up with her shortly after that, and she remained with him for what was left of the day. They spoke at length about what lay ahead, listened, listing the dangers that they had already encountered, and debating what they would require to make a journey back through the madness that lay without. Garth seemed relaxed and confident, but then he always seemed that way. They agreed that whatever else happened, they would stay close to each other. She saw Gavilan only once, and only for a moment. It was late that afternoon, and he was leaving the palace on yet another strand, on another errand, as she came across the lawn. He smiled at her and waved, as if everything was as it should be, as if the whole world was set right. And in spite of her irritation at his casual manner, she found herself smiling and waving back. 
she would have spoken with him if she had if she could have managed it, but Garth was there and several of Gavilan's companions as well, and there was no opportunity. He did not reappear after that, although she made it a point to look for him. As dusk approached, she found herself alone in her room once more, staring out the windows at the dying light, thinking that she ought to be doing something, feeling as if she were trapped and wondering if she should be fighting to get free. Garth was secluded once again in the adjoining room, and she was about to seek out his company when her door opened and the Queen appeared. Grandmother, she greeted, and she could not mask entirely the relief in her voice. Ellen Rose swept across the room wordlessly and took her in her arms, holding her close. Wren, she whispered, and her arms tightened as if she were afraid that Wren might flee. She stepped back finally, smiled past the momentary mask of sadness, then took Wren's hand and led her to the bed where they seated themselves. I have ignored you shamefully all day. I apologise. It seemed that every time I turned around I was remembering something else that needed doing, some small task I had forgotten that had to be completed before tonight. She paused. Wren, I am sorry to have gotten you involved in this business. The problems we made for ourselves should not be yours as well. But there is no help for it. I need you, child. Do you forgive me? Wren's head... Wren shook her head, confused. There is nothing to forgive, Grandmother. When I decided to bring Alanon's message to you, I chose to involve myself. I knew that if you heeded that message, I would be coming with you. I never thought of it in any other way. Wren, you give me such hope. I wish that Elaine was here to see you. She would have been proud. You have her strength and her determination. The smooth brow furrowed. I miss her so much. She has been gone for years. And still, it seems that she has only stepped away for a moment. I sometimes find myself looking for her even now. Grandmother, Wren said quietly, waiting until the other's eyes were locked on her own. Tell me about the magic. What is it that you and Gavilan and Eowyn and the Owl and everyone else knows that I don't? Why does it frighten everyone so? For a moment, Ellen Roe Lissadell did not respond. Her eyes went hard, and her body stiffened. Wren could see, in that instant, the iron resolve that a grandmother could call upon when she was in need. A casting that belied the youthful face and slender form. A silence settled between them. Wren held her gaze steady refusing to look away, determined to put an end to the secrets between them. The Queen's smile when it came was unexpected and bitter. As I said, you are like Elaine. She released Wren's hands as if anxious to establish a boundary between them. There are some things I would like to tell you that I cannot. Not yet. In any case, I have my reasons, and you will have to accept my assurance that they are good ones. So I will tell you what I can, and there the matter must rest. She sighed and let the bitterness of a smile drift away. The magic is unpredictable, Wren. 
It was so in the beginning. It remains so now. You know yourself from the tales of the Sword of Shannara and the Elf Stone. That the magic is not a constant. That it does not always do what is expected. That it reveals itself in surprising ways. And that it evolves with the passage of time and use. It is a truth that seems to continually elude us. One that must be constantly relearned. When the elves came to, into Morrowind, they decided to recover the magic to rediscover the old ways and to model themselves after their forefathers. The problem, of course, was that the model had long since been broken and no one had kept the plans. Recovery of the magic was ac accomplished more easily than expected, but mastering it once in hand was something else again. Attempts were made, many failed, in the course of those attempts, the demons were led into being. Inadvertent and unfortunate, but a fact just the same. Once here, they could not be dispatched. They flourished and reproduced, and despite every effort employed to destroy them, they survived. She shook her head as if seeing those efforts parade before her eyes. You would ask me why they cannot be sent back to wherever they came from, wouldn't you? That the magic doesn't work that way. It will not permit so easy a solution. Gavilan among them, among others, believes that further experimentation with the magic will reduce better results. That trial and error will eventually give us a way to defeat the creatures. I do not agree. I understand the magic, Ren, because I have used it and I know the extent of its power. I am afraid of what it can do. There are no limits, really. It dwarfs us as mortal creatures. It lacks the restraints of our humanity. It is greater than we are. It will survive after we are all long, dead and gone. I have no faith in it beyond that which has been gleaned out of experience and is required by necessity. I believe that if we, can, if we continue to test it, if we continue to believe that the solution of our problem lies in what it can do, then some new horror will find its way into our lives. And we will wish that the demons were all that we had to deal with. And what of the offstones? Ren asked her quietly. Alan Rowe nodded, smiled and looked away. Yes, child. What of the elf stones? What of their magic? We know what it can do. We have seen its results. When elven blood fails, when it is not strong enough, as it was not strong enough in Will Omsford, it creates unexpected results. The wish song, good and bad, both. She looked back again, but the magic of the offstone is known and it is contained. No one believes or suggests that it could be subverted to another use, nor the lodum. We have some understanding of these magics and will employ them because we must if we are to survive. But there is much greater magic waiting to be discovered, child. Magic that lives beneath the earth, that can be found in the air, and that cries out for recognition. That is the magic that Gavilon would gather. 
It is the same magic that the druid called Brona sought to harness more than a thousand years ago. The same magic that convinced him to become the Warlock Lord and then destroyed him. Ren understood her grandmother's fear of the magic, could see the dangers as she saw them, and could share with her as no one else the feeling that could that invocate that invocation of the magic aroused. In the elf stones, the loden power that could overwhelm, that could subvert, that could swallow you up until you were lost. You said you wanted the elves to go back to the way that they were before they recovered their magic, she said, thinking back to the previous night when Ellen Rowe had addressed the High Council. But can that happen? Won't some among the elves simply bring it back again? Perhaps find it another way? No, Ellen Rowe's eyes were suddenly distant. Not again. Not ever again. She was leaving something out. Wren sensed it immediately. Sensed as well that it was not something Ellen Rowe would discuss. And what is the magic you have already invoked? That which protects the city. It will all disappear once we leave. All but that required to fulfill the Loden's use and to carry the elves and Arbilon back into the Westland. All but that. And the elf stones? The Queen smiled. There are no absolutes, Wren. The elf stones have been with us for a long time. I could cast them away once we are safe. Yes, child, you could. Should you choose to do so? Wren felt something unspoken pass between them, but she could not entirely identify its meaning. Will the magic of the Loden really do as you believe, Grandmother? Will it carry the elves safely out of Morrowind? The Queen's smooth face lowered momentarily, shaded with doubt and something more. Oh, the magic is there, certainly. I have felt it in my use of the staff. I have been told its secrets, and I know it to be the truth. Her face had lifted abruptly. But it is we, Wren, who must do the carrying. It is we who must see to it that those who have been gathered up by the Loden spell, our people, are restored to the world again, that they are given a new chance at life. Magic alone is not enough. It is never enough. Our lives and ultimately the lives of all those who depend upon us are forever our responsibility. The magic is only a tool. Do you understand? Wren nodded somberly. I will do anything I can to help she said softly. But I tell you now that I wish the magic dead and gone. All of it. Every last bit. Everything from shadow into demons, to load into elf stones. I would see it all destroyed. The Queen rose. And if it were in, what then would take its place? The sciences of the old world come back to life. A greater power still. It would be something you know. It will always be something. She reached down and pulled Wren up with her. Call Garth now and come with me to dinner and smile. Whatever else might come of this, we have found each other. I am very glad that you are here. She hugged Wren close once more, holding her. Wren hugged her back and said, I'm glad too, Grandmother. All of the members of the inner circle of the High Council were in attendance at dinner that night. Eaten shard 
Barsimon Oreo, Oren Street, Tris Gavlan, and the Queen, together with Wren, Garth, and Eowon Cerise, all those who had been present when the decision was made to invoke the Loden's power and abandon Morrowind. Even Court and Dahl were there, standing watch in the halls beyond, barring any from entering, including the service staff once the food was on the table. Comfortably secluded, those gathered discussed the arrangements for the coming day. Talk was animated and direct with the discussions about equipment, supplies, and proposed routes dominating the conversation. Helen Rowe, after consulting with the owl, had decided that the best time to attempt an escape was just before dawn when the demons were weary from the night's prowl and anxious for sleep and a full day's light ahead for travel. Night was the most dangerous time to be out, for the demons always hunted then. It would take the company of nine a bit more than a week to reach the beaches if all went smoothly. If any of them doubted that it would really happen that way, at least they kept it to themselves. Gavilan sat across from Red, one place removed, and smiled at her often. She was aware of his attention and politely acknowledged it, but directed her talk to her grandmother and the owl and Garth. She ate something, but later she couldn't remember what. Listened to the others talk, glancing frequently as, at Gavilan as if studying him might somehow reveal the mystery of his attraction and thinking distractedly about what the queen had told her earlier or more to the point what she hadn't told her. The Queen's revelations on close examination were a trifle threadbare. It was all and well and good to say that the magic had been recovered and well, where had it been recovered from? It was fine to admit that recovery had somehow triggered the release of the demons that besieged them, but what was it about the magic that had freed them? And from where? Wren still hadn't heard a word about what had gone wrong with usage of the magic, or why it was that no magic was available to undo the wrong that had been done. What her grandmother had given her was a sketch without shadings or colours, or background of any kind. It wasn't enough by half. And yet Ellen Rowe had insisted that it must be. Wren sat with her thoughts buzzing inside like gnats. The conversations flowed heatedly about her as faces turned this way and that. The light failed without as the darkness closed down, and time passed by with silent footsteps. A retreat from the past, a stealthy approach toward a future that might change them all forever. She felt disconnected from everything about her, as if she had been dropped into place at the dinner table quite unexpectedly. An uninvited guest, an eavesdropper on the lives of those about her, even Garth's familiar presence, failed to comfort her, as she said little to him. When dinner ended, she went straight to her room to sleep, stripped off her clothing, slipped beneath the bed covering, and lay waiting in the dark for things to change back again. They refused, her breathing slowed, her thoughts scattered, and at last she fell asleep. Even though she was awake again and dressed before the knock on the door that was meant to rouse her, Gavilan stood there, clothed in drab, hunter's garb, with weapons strapped all about, the familiar grin, shelled, looking like someone else entirely. I thought that you might like to walk down to the wall with me, he said simply. Her smile in response brought a trace of his own. I would, she agreed. With Garth in tow, they departed the palace and moved through the dark, deserted streets of the city. Rena thought the people would be awake and wakeful and watchful, anxious to observe what would happen when the magic of the Loden was invoked. The homes of the elves were dark and silent. 
and those who watched did so from the shadows. Perhaps Alan Rowe had not told them when the transformation would occur, she thought. She became aware of someone following them and glanced back to find Court a dozen paces behind. Tris must have dispatched them to make certain they reached their appointed gathering spot on time. Tris would be the queen, would be with the queen or Eowyn, Cerise or Orin Striat or Darwood. All of them shepherded down to the keel, to the door that led out into the desolation behind, into the harsh and barren emptiness that they must traverse in order to survive. They survived without incident, the darkness unbroken, the dawn's light still hidden beneath the horizon. All was gathered. The Queen, Yoan, the Owl, Triss, Dal, now the four of them. Only nine, Ren thought, suddenly aware of how few they were and how much depended on them. They exchanged hugs and hand clasps and furtive words of encouragement. Handful of shadows whispering into the night. All wore hunter's garb, loose fitting and hardy protection against the weather and to some small measure the dangers that waited without. All carried weapons, safe save for Yoan and the Queen. Alan Rowe carried the rook staff, its dark wood glimmering faintly the load in a prism of colours that winked and shimmered even in the near black. Atop the keel, the magic was a steady glow that illuminated the battlements and reached heavenwards. Elven hunters patrolled the walls in groups of half a dozen and sentries stood at watch within their towers. From without, the growls and hissings were sporadic and distant, as if the things emitting them lacked interest, and they would as well have slept. We'll give them a surprise before this night is over, won't we? Gavilan whispered in her ear, a tentative smile on his face. Just so long as the, the ones who end up being surprised, she whispered back. She saw Oren Strip by the door leading down into the tunnels, and moved over to stand beside him. His rumpled body shifted in the gloom. He glanced at her and nodded. Eyes and ears sharp red. I guess so. Elfstone's handy. Her mouth tightened. The Elfstones were in a new leather bag strung about her neck. She could feel their weight resting against her chest. She had managed to avoid thinking about them until now. Do you think I'll need them? He shrugged. You did last time. She was silent for a moment, considering the prospect. Somehow she had thought she might escape Morrowind without having to call on the magic again. It seems quite quiet out there, she ventured hopefully. He nodded, his slender frame draping against itself against the stone. They won't be expecting us. We'll have our chance. She leaned back next to him, shoulders touching. How good a chance will it be, Al? He laughed tonelessly. What difference does it make? It is the only chance we have. But Simon already materialised out of the darkness, went directly to the Queen, spoke to her in hushed tones for a few minutes and then disappeared again. He looked haggard and worn, but there was determination in his step. How long have you been going out there? She asked the owl suddenly, not looking at him. Out with them. There was a hesitation. He knew what she meant. She could feel his eyes fixing on her. I don't know anymore. What I want to know, I guess, is how you made yourself do it. I can barely make myself go even this once, knowing what's out there. She swallowed against the admission. I mean, 
I can't do it because it's the only choice. I won't have to do it again. But you had a choice each time before this. You must have thought better of it more than once. You must not have wanted to go. Wren. She turned when he spoke her name and faced him. Let me tell you something you haven't learned yet. Something you learn only by living a while. As you get older, you find that life begins to wear you down. Doesn't matter who you are or what you do, it happens. Experience, time, events, they all conspire against you to steal away your energy, to erode your confidence, to make you question things you wouldn't have given a second thought to when you were young. It happens gradually, a chipping away that you won't, that you don't even notice at first. And then one day it's there, you wake up and you just don't have the fire anymore. He smiled faintly. Then you have a choice. You can either give in to what you're feeling and just say, okay, enough is enough and be done with it. Or you can fight it. You can accept that every day you're alive, you, you're going to have to face it down. That you're going to have to say to yourself that you don't care what you feel. That it doesn't matter what happens to you because sooner or later, it is going to happen anyway. And you're going to do what you have to do because otherwise you're defeated. And life doesn't have any real purpose left. When you can do that, little Wren, when you can accept the wearing down and the eroding, then you can do anything. How did I manage to keep going out at nights? I just told myself I didn't matter at all that much, that those in here mattered more. You know something. It's not so really hard. You just have to get past the fear. She thought about it a minute and then nodded. I think you make it sound a lot easier than it is. The owl lifted off the wall. Do I? He asked. Then he smiled anew and walked away. Wren drifted back over to stand with Gar. The big rover pointed to the ramparts of the keel. The oven hunters were coming down off the height furtive, silent figures, easing out of the light and down into the shadows. Wren glanced eastward and saw the first faint tinge of dawn against the black. It is time, Alan Rose said suddenly, and motioned them toward the wall. They moved quickly, Oren streeted in the lead, pulling open the doorway that led down into the tunnel, pausing at the entry to look back at the queen. Alan Rowe had moved away from the wall to the bridgehead, stopping just before she reached its ramp to plant the butt end of the rook firmly in the earth. From somewhere within Avalon, a bell tolled, a signal, and those few elven hunters who remained atop the keel slipped hurriedly away. In seconds, the wall was deserted. Alan Rory Lesserdale glanced back at the eight who, who waited just once, then turned to face the city. Her hands clasped the polished shaft of the rook and her head lowered. Instantly, the loading began to glow. The brightness grew rapidly to white fire, flaring outwardly until the queen was enveloped. Steadily, the light continued to spread, rising up against the darkness, filling the space within the walls until all of Arbalon was lit as bright as day. Wren tried to watch what was happening, but the intensity of the light grew until it blinded her and she was forced to look away. The white fire flooded to the parapets of the keel and began to churn. 
Ren could feel it happen more than she could see it. Her eyes closed against the glare. Without the demon began to shriek. There was a rush of wind that came out of nowhere and grew into a howl. Ren dropped to her knees, feeling Garth's strong arm come up about her shoulders and hearing Gavilan's voice call to her. Images formed in her mind, triggered by Ellen Rose's summoning wild and erratic visions of a world in chaos. The magic was racing past her, a brushing of fingers that whispered and sang. It ended in a shriek, a sound that no voice could have made, and then the light rushed away, whipping back into the black, withdrawing as if sucked down into a whirlpool. Ren's eyes jerked up, following the motion, trying to see she was just quick enough to catch the last of it as it disappeared into the Loden's brilliant orb. She blinked once again and it was gone. The city of Avalon was gone as well. The people, the buildings, the streets and walkways, the gardens and lawn, the trees, everything from wall to wall within the keel disappeared. All that remained was a shallow crater in the earth as if a giant hand had simply scooped Avalon up and spirited away. Alan Rowe Lesserdale stood alone at the edge of what had once been the moat and was now the lip of the crater. Leaning heavily on the rookstar, her own energy drained, above her the loading was a prism of many coloured fire. The queen stirred herself, tried to move and failed, stumbled and fell to her knees. Triss raced back for her instantly, lifted her as if she were a weary child and started back again. It was then that then that Wren realised that the magic they had protected the keel had faded as well. Just as her grandmother had forewarned, its glow vanished completely. Overhead the sky was enveloped in a haze of fog and the sunray was a sun, sullen lightning or the eastern sky is barely able to penetrate the night's blackness. Ren drew a breath and found the stench of sulphur had returned. All that had been Arbalon's shelter had vanished. The silence of a moment earlier gave way to a cacophony of demon howls and shrieks. The realisation of what had happened set in. The sound of bodies scrambling onto the walls and of claws digging in rose from every quarter. Triss had reached them. The queen and the rook staff clutched in his arms. Inside, quickly, the owl shouted, hurrying ahead, hastening to follow after him. The others of the little company charged with the safe delivery of Arbalon and its elves, disappeared through the, door, the open door and down into the black.